Good morning. Wake up. I tell you, if you're not woken up from all that good uh, worship, you're just uh, not woken up, are you? But uh, we've already had a sunrise service earlier this morning. So it's about what it felt like. Uh, but anyway, we're glad that you're here and just going to talk about an issue that affects all of our families. In fact, would, would it surprise you to know the highest rate of problems in marriages and in families stems from financial situations? The statistic I have is like 37%. I don't know how they come up with that percentage, but it's not saying that, that it's finances that breaks families up. They're just saying the highest rate of issues and problems comes from financial situations. Um, that 70% of all consumers are basically living from paycheck to paycheck, which basically means has, this is not saying anything about what anybody makes. This is saying something about what people spend. In other words, by the end of the month, their money is already spent before they get to the end of the month, no matter what they're making. Would it surprise you that the average uh, family would have to use a credit card to pay a $1,500 unexpected expense? In other words, on the home or the car or something uh, of that nature. And that nearly half of all Americans, 46%, have less than $10,000 saved for their retirement. I mean, we, not only does our government have this huge financial problem in our government's eyes, so our nation, but then we as consumers uh, have come up with our own issues uh, alongside of that. And, you know, We've, we've seen in a great way how the Scripture has a lot to say to us and our families about marriages and relationships and all that. But the question is, does the Scriptures have, any say anything, have, have anything to say about our finances and the management of money? Well, as a matter of fact, it does. And I think it's just as practical today uh, as it was when they talked about those issues. In fact, there's some 800 times that the Scriptures talked about money. And we're going to work through every single one of those this morning. Uh, no, we don't have time to do that. But I do have an interesting scripture. Every line of it, we could just preach an entire message on it from 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 10. The verse 6 says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. Reminds me of the joke when the guy got up to St. Peter and he had a bag of gold with him. And Peter said, come on in. And he looks at what you got in the bag. And he looks, he opens it up. And St. Peter looks at it. What do you got pavement in the bag for? <laughs> we brought nothing into the world and we'll take nothing out. But if we have food and clothing and from the looks of all y'all, You've got clothing, and it looks like you've got food. We will be content with that. How about that thought this morning? Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith. They've totally lost their walk with God because of it and have pierced themselves with many griefs. They've brought lots of pain into their own lives. There's another scripture in Luke 16, 11. This, this is Jesus. It says, So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? Think about that for a second. If Jesus has said there's something about how we manage our money, how we are stewards of our money here in this world, there's a direct relation to how we do that as to what he entrusts with us with true riches, with spiritual things. So it automatically elevates right there how, how we handle our finances within our home is a very important issue 
with God. It's important with us, but it's important to God. And this is, you know, it's, it's everybody. It's not just inside the church. It's, it's outside the church. And George Barna says the fastest growing churches are teaching about marriage, child rearing, finances, and careers just as quick as they can because people need help. People need to hear what God's Word is. Well, I want to run through a few things just to talk about this morning. And uh, these may sound about as strange as uh, the, the, the video because some of the simplest things are. But the first principle is, is just to avoid debt. To, to find financial freedom and, and peace in our life is to avoid debt. Now, the Scripture doesn't say we can't borrow. He just says he warns against borrowing without a sure way to repay. In, in other words, when we borrow something, it ought to be strategic, and we ought to have some way that we know we can repay. And if collateral is used to cover the balance of the loan, then that fits one of those definitions, it, it, a loan that's not against God's warnings. But most of America's debts, most of our debts, are, are with inadequate collateral to satisfy the loan agreement. And, you know, when you, if you got debt, sometimes it, it causes you to do strange things. And I, I read about one guy that had a, had a new truck, and he was follow, falling behind on his payments. And he didn't know what was going to happen. He couldn't make the payments. So he rams it over and over into a tree, thinking that the insurance company will just pay it off. The problem was somebody saw the whole thing. Now the insurance company's not going to pay it off. His truck's ruined, and he still owes the same amount of money for it. I mean, how foolish can we be? A golfer said, I'm working as hard as I can to get my life and my cash to run out at the same time. And if I can die right after lunch on Tuesday, everything will be fine. Proverbs 22, 7 says, The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. I think that's what we always need to, to realize is that when, when we borrow money, we're going to be a servant to that lender. So we need to make sure that we're very uh, careful and astute with what we're doing because debt has nothing to do with our income. It's how we're handling our money. You know, there, there's so many people, people who've won lotteries that have had to file for bankruptcy. A guy named Buddy Post had won $16 million in Pennsylvania and was having to sell the last five years of his payments and filing for bankruptcy. So basically what we're talking about is how we manage. And that's what Jesus was saying, how, how we manage. And one good way is is to avoid debt where impossible. But there's some traps of this unneeded uh, debt. For instance, you know, we overestimate the importance of wealth when we get into this unneeded debt cycle. Um, Luke 15, 12, the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the state. So he divided his property between them. Give me my share of the estate. Here was a young man whose his dad's money was more important to him than his relationship with his dad. And that can happen to us. When money gets very important to us, it can supersede our concern for our relationships with one another. And it's always going to be more important. They did a survey, a poll of 200,000 college students. 76% of them said that their main goal was to be wealthy. 24% wanted a meaningful life. I suggest that there's a potential of that swapping as life goes along. Because even those who might have attained great wealth can testify, no matter how much money, you have it can't bring you quality of life. Hugo Chavez, 58 years old, $2 billion in his account, and it couldn't buy him one more day. So we have to be careful that it does not get over important to us. We want instant gratification. A young man says, Dad, I want mine right now. 
You know, years ago, another generation, people might get a house and they might buy one piece of furniture, maybe a bed, maybe not even a bed. They'd buy whatever they could afford to start with and keep adding. Today, it's just totally different. We fill the whole thing with brand new furniture right to start with. We put it on the credit card. And therefore, we want everything right now. And we, we'll worry about paying for it later. In fact, total consumer credit, I'm not talking about government credit. Now. Total consumer credit just among us is in the trillions. Credit card debt carried by the average American in the thousands. Total finance charges in the billions. One man who said his wife's credit cards were stolen, but he didn't report them because the thief was spending less than his wife. <laughs> I suppose it could be the other way around, too. We want instant gratification, uh, and we don't anticipate hard times when we're going into debt. You know, everything is good, you know. Uh, after the, the prodigal son had spent everything, there was a severe famine. Well, I bet he didn't anticipate that, did he? We don't anticipate bad things happening and things going wrong. We spend more than our resources allow if your outgo exceeds your income, your upkeep becomes your downfall. We don't spend more than we make. We should spend far less than what we make. So many just make the minimum payments on those credit cards also. Over 1.2 billion credit cards out there. Most of the money that the credit card company makes is, is on our finance charges. They said it take an average of six years for each family to pay off their consumer debt. Anyway, when, when I go through all this and hear all this, what I feel is this weight that's on us all. And, and what that is, now there's this, because of this weight, there's this inability to give to the kingdom. There's this inability to, to feel free to just say, man, God's speaking to me about this area and do it, doing that. And, you know, all this, the interest charges, I can just see billions of dollars that, that Christians could use for the kingdom if we just were smarter in how we managed our finances and didn't have to have things right now and saved up and got things later. So that's the first issue I think we all must watch out and be careful for. It's just this how we accrue debt in our life. Then second principle for financial peace and freedom is budgeting. I don't know how many people make a budget. I don't know if there are very many or not, but the Scripture says in Proverbs 14, 15, a prudent man gives thought to his steps. That means you think about what your priorities are. You think about how you're going to walk in life. You think about, I mean, when you don't have a budget and you're just, you're just spending, you don't know where it's going, you don't know how it's going, so you're not being strategic. You're not following the values that you have in your life. So just, you know, putting down a plan saying, okay, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to live rather than looking at, at everybody else. And wanting what everybody else has. Lisa and I have tried to live by a budget our entire married life. It's something that we sit down together with and we go over and we talk about what we want to give. We, we start with the giving amount right off the top, the tithe and more than the tithe. That's right off the top. That's the beginning point of our budget. This is what we're going to give no matter what. I mean, if an emergency comes up or something else, we never take it from that line item. We take it from some other line item. The food line item would be a good line item to take it from. And then our favorite uncle, Uncle Sam, gets his cut, so we put his cut down there. And then savings. We've always thought that we ought to anticipate emergencies, anticipate things that are coming down the pike where they're... Uh, it, whatever it might be, some amount on savings. And so I've got the tithe and I've got the taxes and I've got the savings. And then we live on the rest. Now the rest is still God's. 
It's not like, okay, I've, give, I've paid the gods off. Now I can do whatever I want with the rest. It's all his. So I'm going to honor him with what's left. But that's, what, that's going to determine how we live. At, after we've built priorities and even, even the rest, we prioritize that. You know, just simple things like paying bills off as, as they come in and uh, paying off any of that credit card debt that might be first, that you might have high interest rates on and all of that needs to come out. I, um, a lady walked in my office the other day and she was telling about her testimony, a very recent testimony about get, uh, uh, being in debt. And I said, and doing a budget, I said, would you write that down for me and can I share it with the congregation? She said, yes said, five years ago next month, I was $30,000 in debt. This is credit card debt, $30,000. 14 years ago, I was remarried. Before that, I'd been a single mom who had to watch every penny. I had two credit cards that I used only in emergencies for gas and food. I'd pay the basic monthly charges and pay them off completely when I got my tax return. Marriage changed everything. I no longer had the tax return to pay off my debt. When we'd been married about three years, both my husband and I had some major health issues, and my response to the stress was to begin spending. I paid what I could, but the interest charges kept mounting. Listen to this next sentence. I was so ashamed and embarrassed. Amidst all of this, I'd been tithing. I knew my finances were out of control, and I turned to him. I sought out the assistance of a Christian financial counseling service and was put on a rigorous budget. My monthly payment was almost half of my monthly salary. I remained obediently, obedient to the Lord and faithfully gave my tithe, and at times, a little more. I knew that this financial burden was my own and that with God's help, I would take responsibility for it and not seek a way out. As of six months ago, I am debt free. Praise the Lord. I gave my struggle to him and was obedient, and he delivered me. Now, that's a person in freedom now. <laughs> that's a person who has gotten their financial house in order. A person that's free and now able to do the things that they want to do. All because she began to get serious and it became from a, a budget of planning. Okay, I want to move to the third principle for financial freedom is saving. Proverbs 21, 20. In the house of the wise are stores of choice food and oil. But a foolish man devours all he has. <laughs> this lady came out of the 8 o'clock, out of the sunrise service this morning. And uh, she said, I've, I'm teaching this class at, a, at another place. And she said, I basically gained the same talk, same talk you gave this morning. So I had four students. And every single one of them said, no, 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 we're going to spend all that we make. We're going to spend every bit that we make. While we're making it, we're going to spend it. No concept of saving whatsoever. No concept of planning ahead. I mean, we need to set something aside no matter how little it is. Just get in the practice of saying, okay, we're going to set this aside for this. Maybe you're saving for retirement. Maybe you're saving for a car. Maybe you're saving uh, for college for your students. You know, just set something aside, and it is amazing how it will build up and add up over time. My parents, God bless their souls, took out a little insurance policy when I was born. And unknown to me, but when I turned 25, they told me about it. And they said, it's matured, and it's $5,000. This was in 1978. And they said, would you like the money, or would you like a gift? I said, I like a gift. They said, what do you want? I said, I want a new car. And they bought me a new car. We spent the whole 
amount on the new car. But one of the things I thought, I said, you know, I'm going to be buying a car, having to pay for a car the rest of my life. I could not foresee not having to need a car. So I had this car, and I got it in 78, but in 1980 was when the first time I started getting a paycheck. And we didn't set aside a whole car payment, but we set aside something that was dedicated to a car payment, <laughs> to, a, to a future car when this one wore out. And six years later, when we bought our first new car, we paid cash for it. I mean, we were, we were surprised. <laughs> We'd been able to save that because really until about three years ago when Lisa started working at, uh, at the St. Mark campus, we'd been a one-income family. And for 20 of our 30 years, that one income wasn't a whole lot. But we were trying to save on the things that we did to try to be prudent in our steps by operating by our priorities and a budget and then setting aside things. And it was surprising, you know, how things could add up over the years. And it's all an attempt to try to honor God with what he's blessed us and to be prudent, as this says. A foolish man devours all that he has. There's just no reason to ever spend every single thing that we have. Then lastly, the fourth principle of financial freedom is giving. We must learn to give. This takes care of the overspending. If you can make that a priority in your life, that above all, I want to be a giver. Above all, that's God's heart. So I want to be like God in my own heart because he's a giver. He gave us Jesus. He gives us what we have. He created the world on, on and on. 1 Timothy 6, 18 through 19, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. There's a way to lay up treasure for the coming age. In other words, if you were alive during the Civil War, and you had a lot of Confederate money, and you saw which way this thing was going to go, that it wasn't going to be Confederate money that's going to be worth anything. Wouldn't you be trying to convert it into something that's going to work at the next currency? <laughs> well, I tell you, your dollar bills are Confederate money as far as the kingdom of heaven is concerned. And there's just a short, if you see which way this thing's going to go, <laughs> in a short amount of time, everything you've got is going to be like pavement up there. So we got to look for some way to send that ahead, to to treasures that said is our firm foundation. The scripture says the first way we do that is by bringing the tithe to the storehouse. Leviticus 27 30. They would tell the people a tithe of everything from the land where the grain from the soil or fruit from the trees belongs to the Lord. It's his. It's holy to the Lord. Proverbs 3 9 11. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of your crops, not what's left over, not after we buy everything we want, after we pay Uncle Sam and do all that. Then if we've got something left over, he says, no, honor me with your first fruits. And then in Malachi, the people ask a question. Malachi says, question, will a man rob God? And his answer God spoke through Malachi in Malachi 3.10. Bring the whole tithe to the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And then look at this. Test me in this, said the Lord. Here's one of the few things where God says to test him. And see if I will throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. You know, people want to give up chocolate for Lent. I say, well, why don't you tithe for Lent? Why don't you do something significant? If you're not tither, tithe for Lent. I mean, come on, test God. See how he does. You know, speaking of credit cards, have you seen, I know you have, because everybody's seen them, the Capital One credit card commercial. They've made over a billion dollars on this, this commercial with the, the Vikings that come in. And uh, I mean, whoever came up with that idea, it certainly got everybody's attention. And, and then they end the, the commercial uh, with it. They say, what's in your wallet? If you don't have the right thing in your wallet, boy, you're, you're in a lot of trouble. But it appeals to our self-sufficiency. In other words, there's something that I can have in my wallet that takes care of everything. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, 
I've got my resources. I've got the ticket in my wallet. What's in your wallet? This weekend we've spent in St. Augustine, Lisa and I had a, a, a missions retreat, and one of the, my close friends there is married to the daughter of Dr. Dennis Kinlaw. And he was the president of Asbury University when I was there. And he's 90 years old now, so I was interested on hearing about him and how he's doing. So his mind was just sharp as a tack, was great preacher, great man of God, great leader of that school. But he wrote an article in a magazine a few weeks ago, a few months ago. And I remember reading it. He told a story when he was eight years old. He said, you know, they, they, were, they lived in North Carolina. They were a poor family. And he began looking around at what the other boys had and how the other boys were doing. And he felt badly that he didn't have some of that and wasn't kind of measuring up. And so one morning, before he went to school, he took a dollar out of his mother's purse and went to school. The next day, he said, when they all got dressed and ready to go to school, his mama said, all y'all run on the long to school except Dennis. He said, I knew right then something was really, really wrong that mama didn't let me go to school. He said, she'd always made sure we went to school said, we sat down. She began to talk to me. She said, she wasn't necessarily a big educated woman, but she gave me a lesson in metaphysics that day. My first one at the age of eight. She said, Dennis, I'm not upset with you that you felt bad that you weren't like the other boys. I'm not upset with you that you wanted to have what everybody else has. Really not upset with you that you took the dollar that much. What I'm upset with is that you broke the heart of God. And now today, you're going to stay home, and we're going to see if we can get your heart right with God. I'd make a preacher out of somebody, wouldn't it? A seminary professor and a Christian college president to have a mother to teach you that at eight. People look at the church, and you know the question they think we're asking? What's in your wallet? <laughs> it's really not true. The question we're asking, more importantly, the question I think God's asking, every one of us, is what's in our heart? That's the real question. When we get the heart right with God, it takes care of the wallet. It's not a matter of what's in the wallet. That's the world system. God's way is what's in the heart. And that's how he knows how we manage and handle what we have, that he can put true riches in us when we do it well. Next week, in this service and all of our services, we have the opportunity to indicate what we plan on giving and what we're doing. Use this as a week to ask, not what's in your wallet, but ask yourself what's in your heart and what God's leading you to do, how God's leading you to manage all of your finances, really, and what to do with it in a way that we can honor God, a way that we can move forward the kingdom of God ultimately is the purpose. Let Thank you for listening to our message today. I hope that you've been inspired to act upon what you've just heard and become a doer of the word. Feel free to contact us through the information on the screen or through our website. Better yet, if you're ever in the Niceville, Florida area, feel free to stop by and visit us at the Niceville United Methodist Church.